good morning everyone and welcome to Church Online. If you're tuning in for the first time, my name is Callum and I'm one of the pastors here at Elam in Paisley. Today we have Pastor James Glass speaking. James was the pastor of Glasgow Elam up until recently and he's just taken on the position as regional leader taking over from Kevin Pete and you're going to hear more about that uh, later on. We're going to worship God through singing. Uh, we can't broadcast from the church but all of our worship is pre-recorded from the last few weeks when we could. So we're going to pray together just now and let's come into God's house this morning with singing and thanksgiving wherever you are. If you're in a living room, if you're driving a train, I hope you're not, uh, you're not watching this at the same time. But we want to worship God with all of our hearts today. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you that we get to worship you. And it's an honor and it's a blessing. Lord, we want to receive everything that you've got for us, but we also want to give you praise, adoration and worship today. Help us to do that, Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. of heaven you conquered the grave you free every captain and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awaken alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted i oh god you have done great Through every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promises, yes and amen. God, you do great things. God, you do great things. of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captain, you break every chain, oh God, you have to great. we dance in your freedom, the way get alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted I, oh God, you have to Hallelujah, you have done great things, have done great things. the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom the way king alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted i
above it all Hallelujah God Unshakable Hallelujah You have done great things Hallelujah God Above it all Hallelujah God Unshakable Hallelujah You have done great Alpha Online starts this Wednesday, the 20th, at 8 o'clock. We've got a couple of groups starting already, um, but there's plenty of space. So if you have a friend or yourself who want to join us, what you need to do is go uh, to ecfpaisley.org forward slash alpha and you can register there so that we can send you out more details before the Zoom meeting starts on Wednesday. It's only one hour each week. Um, so... Grab a coffee, put on your big slipper. So no matter what the weather, you can join us from the comfort of your own home and find out questions about life, Christianity and why we're even here.
start with a game. Robert is going to tell us two truths and one lie and can you guess which one the lie is? Well, um, I have been on the stage of the King's Theatre in Glasgow and you have to guess, was I singing and playing the guitar? Was I a ventriloquist's dummy? Was I a statue in a museum? What do you think? Mm, I think maybe number two. What do you think? One? Maybe? Can you tell us which was the lie? The lie was, I've never sung and played the guitar on the King's Theatre. So in today's story, we will hear how Delilah tried to get Samson to tell her the truth about where his strength came from. But he kept telling her lies. We'll hear more about this later. Samson was one of the judges of Israel. His story comes from the Book of Judges and comes after the story of Gideon. We hear, who we heard about last week. As you listen to the story of Samson, think about how God used him for God's glory and the good of the Israelites. In the years before Samson was born, Israel had many leaders. Israel would forget about God and start worshipping the false gods of the surrounding nations. God would punish Israel by allowing their enemies to conquer the nation. Eventually God's people would cry out to him and he would send a judge or a leader to help the people defeat their enemies. Finally, Israel would enjoy a time of peace until they began to forget God again and their troubles would start all over. But God had a plan to rescue his people from their enemies. Samson met a woman named Delilah. Israel's enemies, the Philistines, went to Delilah in secret and offered her money if she would find out where Samson's power came from and how he could be defeated. Delilah asked Samson, what made him so strong? Three times she asked Samson and three times he gave her false answers. He first told her that if he was tied up with seven fresh cords, his strength would leave him. Second, he told her that if he was tied up with new ropes that had never been used, he would become weak. Thirdly, he told her that if his hair was woven together, he would become weak. None of those answers were true. Let's see what happens next. Samson. Samson was a super strong Israelite judge, but not the kind of judge who sits in a courtroom and decides who's guilty and who's not. Being a judge meant Samson's job was to be a leader for the Israelites. Judges helped people with their problems and made big decisions. On top of being a judge, 
Samson was also the greatest warrior in all of Israel. He fought a lion with his bare hands, tore down city gates, and fought a thousand soldiers using just the jawbone of a donkey. Also, he had really long hair, but not just because he liked it. It was because God had said that if Samson ever cut his hair, his strength would go away. He wouldn't be super strong anymore. One day, Samson met a woman named Delilah, and he trusted her with the secret to his super strength. But turns out, he had trusted the wrong person, because Delilah told Samson's secret to his enemies, the Philistines. Once they knew that, they cut off his hair and threw him in prison. And he stayed there for a while. In prison, Samson had time to talk to God and repent. And his hair had time to grow back. Later, the Philistines brought Samson out to make fun of him in front of a huge crowd at their temple. And then Samson reached out his arms and pushed over the temple with his bare hands, killing his enemies. Samson wasn't perfect. In fact, he made a lot of wrong choices. But God still used Samson to protect his people. And that's just a little bit about Samson. Judges 16, 29 to 38 says, Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood. Bracing himself against them, Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple of the rulers and all the people in it. God used Samson to defeat the Philistines, the Israelites' enemies. Samson might seem like an unlikely person for God to use. He was proud, had a bad temper, and disobeyed God. But God still used him, and in the end, Samson brought glory to God. Samson gave his life so that he could defeat the Philistines and the Israelites could be freed. In some ways, Samson's story reminds us of Jesus. Jesus also died in order to save others. Did Jesus die to save us from enemies like the Philistines? No. What did Jesus save us from? Our sin. Jesus gave his very life so that our sin could be forgiven and we could have eternal life with God. Samson's story reminds us that only God is able to save us from our biggest enemy, sin. Samson was strong, but God's way is stronger. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, that you still want to use us even if we make wrong choices. And I just pray that you would help everyone to obey you, to listen to your voice and obey you. And just bless everyone and protect them as well. Amen. Amen. So goodbye everyone. Hope you all have a really good week. Bye. Bye. Well, we're now at that part of our service where we're moving on to our Give It. Obviously, we're not together physically, but we are meeting online and you can give online. Details will be coming up on the screen. You can give via Bax transfer or you can go to ecfpaisley.org forward slash giving for a secure and easy way to give. If you're tuning in from another church, can I just encourage you to be giving to your own place of worship in your own church in this season? That's really important to us. And let's be supporting local businesses and charities in these tough lockdown months that we find ourselves in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. You know every one of our needs. And Lord, I ask that you would come and provide for everything that your people need in this season as we give to you today. In your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
the rage in me to still every way at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear oh Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus call these bones to live call these lungs to sing once again I will praise breathe breathe call these bones to live call these lungs to sing once again darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, I'll sing that again, Jesus, 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 you make the darkness tremble, Jesus,
Good morning, everyone. It's my privilege to introduce the preacher this morning. It's a, someone I've wanted to come to preach in Paisley for years, and it's just never worked out. So here we, we'll have him a, in a minute on video, but I'm looking forward to him coming live once we're all back together again. It's, it's James Glass who's speaking. Now, James has been a member of the National Leadership Team for a good few years now, and until the end of December there, he was pastoring in Glasgow, Elam. In fact, Fraser Donaldson, who was preaching here a few weeks ago, is taking over from him in uh, Glasgow. And uh, James, as the, now the new re regional uh, leader, has taken over from Kevin Peat, and uh, we just know he's going to do a, a great job. He was really chosen by all the men, all the pastors in the area. And uh, we look forward to a new era with James at the head. James is a personal friend of mine and I just love his heart for God. I love his integrity. I love the, the fact that, that he's, his humility, there's, there's no, he's, he's not ambitious, selfish ambition at all. And uh, I just see God's hand on him. And the message that he's bringing was recorded in, in October, but it's as relevant today as it was then. And uh, I'm sure that you will be open to, to, to hear what God wants to say to you. So let's just pray right now. Father, we just pray for James and Beryl as they take on this new role as regional leaders, that they will be blessed and feel supported by all the churches. That's us, Lord. And Father, that we will just stay, Lord, just see an incredible thing happen in Scotland, Lord, and the north of England as they take over these regions. We speak blessing over their family, Lord, that, Father, you'll protect them and that they will grow in you. And, Lord, will know that each one, Lord, in their family and Beryl and James will know the love of God and the love of those who they lead. And so, Lord, open up our hearts to receive today the things you want to say to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everyone. This is my first sermon as a regional leader. Uh, I thought I would put something together for you. Uh, you might want to use this on a Sunday to give yourself a break. It gives you a chance to, to hear from the new regional leader. I should say also, thank you so much for all of those uh, who voted for me. Uh, thank you for all your messages of support. Beryl and I have uh, felt really encouraged by uh, the things that you have said to us and sent to us. I want to talk today from Jeremiah 29. It's a very well-known passage of Scripture, probably because of verse 11, uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, and so on and so forth. And uh, that particular Scripture has become very well-known in our era. It's a favorite of many people. But the Scripture itself, uh, verse 11, was written in the context of a letter that Jeremiah sent to the people in exile. And in all honesty, the contents of that letter weren't what people wanted to hear. So we're going to dig into that in just a few moments. But let me read the scriptures to you. This, I'm going to read from verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. 
A good few years ago, Beryl and I were on holiday in Cyprus. Um, it was one of those very, very memorable holidays. Uh, we had a lovely villa that we stayed in with some friends. We went off a, with a couple of friends and we uh, rented this villa. Uh, we got this little hire car uh, to take us around the island. And it was in August, so the weather was just so good that uh, it was a case of shall we go to the beach today or shall we do the touristy thing and go and visit uh, historic sites? We, we, we were spoilt for choice. Anyway, what we decided was one day we'd go to the beach, the next day we would do some touring around, and one day we decided to go up into the Trudos Mountains. Uh, we were told that there was this spectacular monastery that just had to be seen. Uh, so we drove off in our little white Toyota Corolla hire car into the mountains, and uh, we visited the monastery, and it was as spectacular as the tourist brochure had described it. Uh, and then we took a look at the map and we thought, rather than go home the conventional route, and we'll go home through the mountains, uh, the map seemed to clearly outline a, a, a course, a, a journey that would take us back home. It wouldn't take us much longer because it didn't seem on the map to be much further than the uh, route that we had uh, come to where we were. So instead of uh, doing a U-turn in the car and going back the way that we came, uh, we decided to, to keep going in the one direction and trying to follow the, the map at the same time. What we soon discovered was that the, the actual road um, wasn't really what it had seemed on the map. Um, instead of it being a proper road, it was really a, a, a single vehicle, sort of dirt track um, along the side of a mountain. Um, it was single lane, single file, whatever way you want to put it. Um, there wasn't much space between the side of the mountain and um, uh, the <laughs> dropping off the ledge of the mountain. It was just this little road. And we kept driving. We thought, well, eventually we'll get off this road onto a proper road. And uh, we didn't. It just seemed to go on and on forever. And we seemed to be going round and round instead of further forward. To cut a long story short, eventually we made it back, um, but not after much anxiety and I suppose much prayer as well. It just felt for a good couple of hours that we were stuck up a mountain in a white Toyota Corolla. We were stuck up a mountain in a vehicle that wasn't really equipped for that kind of driving and that kind of terrain. We were stuck in a place where we didn't want to be. I guess that's how many of us have felt for the last six months. We're stuck in this place where none of us would choose to be. Um, we're having to cope with something that we have never had to cope with in our lifetime. I don't think we've ever had anything like this, uh, certainly since the end of the Second World War. It's, it's very, very unusual. It was unexpected, and the truth is, we haven't really been sure how to handle it. We've, we've done our best. It just feels like we've been stuck on the side of a mountain in a vehicle that's not equipped for the terrain. We've been stuck in a place that we didn't want to be. I think the people that Jeremiah was writing to found themselves or felt as though they were in a similar situation. They were stuck in Babylon, a place that they didn't want to be. And they hoped to be back from Babylon very soon. I don't know if you can remember back to the early days of, of lockdown. Uh, I can. I can remember thinking, well, we'll be out of church for two weeks, three weeks. And then after Easter, we'll be back again and um, doing what we've always done and so pleased to see each other. Well, you know and I know that um, March became April, April became May, May became June, and here we find ourselves in autumn, uh, running into winter, and we're still in some degree of lockdown right across our country. The people that Jeremiah was writing to, they were stuck in a place that they didn't want to be. 
No self-respecting Jewish person at that time would ever have chosen to live in Babylon. Babylon was the symbol of everything that was wrong. Actually, if you look through the Bible, if you go back to the book of Joshua, and you remember when Achan committed that sin, when, uh, when the people of Israel uh, overcame Jericho and uh, they uh, besieged the city and the city fell into their hands. Do you remember Achan, he took the, the forbidden goods um, that, that should have been destroyed, that shouldn't have been touched by anyone. And, and actually there was a robe from Babylon amongst all of that loot. And then of course, when you go right uh, to the other end of the Bible and you go, go to the book of Revelation, Revelation 18, and there's much rejoicing because Babylon the great has fallen. Uh, that's the picture that we get throughout the word of God about Babylon. It's just, it symbolizes everything that's wrong with this world. Everything that's uh, opposed to God is wrapped up in the label Babylon. So here these people find themselves in Babylon. And the bad news for them that Jeremiah has for them is that they're not going to get back home as quickly as they thought they would. Instead of it just being a few weeks or a few months or even a year, they're going to be stuck in Babylon for 70 years. That must have been a shock to their system. They were going to be in the, stuck in this place that they didn't want to be for some time to come. I hope we're not going to be stuck in the place where we don't want to be with this pandemic for 70 years. I don't think it's going to go on for that long. But I think it's fair to say that it has gone on longer than most of us anticipated and it might go on a little bit longer uh, than many of us expect at this stage. So what do you do when you're stuck in a place that you don't want to be? I think what Jeremiah writes to the people of Judah and Jerusalem who are in exile can help us as we think about how we respond to the situation that we find ourselves in. I think there are a number of things that emerge from this passage of Scripture that are very helpful. I think the first thing that we can say is Jeremiah encourages them to build inward. In fact, you could use the, the term build um, for, to sum up all of Jeremiah's advice here. He encourages them to build inward. He encourages them to embrace the situation that they find themselves in. He encourages them to embrace life in Babylon. Look at what it says in uh, verse 5 and verse 6. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. I'm sure the people of Jerusalem and Judah didn't expect to hear this from the prophet Jeremiah. He's effectively saying, you're going to be here for a while, so you simply need to embrace that and you need to begin to live your life as though you were back in Jerusalem or back in the land of Judah. And he points to some very basic things. He sets out some very basic uh, instructions for them. He says, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat the, the produce. In other words, get on with life and do the simple things. There are some simple things that you can do. There are some basic things that you can do. And you need to begin to build for the future by getting on with what's at hand. He also says that they're to have sons and daughters and to give their sons and daughters in marriage and that they're to increase and not to decrease. I think this is a time for us to, even though we don't like it, to embrace what we're in and begin to think of the future again, to begin to build for the future again. I don't know what that looks like for every individual or for every individual church, but Jeremiah certainly says here, all of you people in exile, you've got to have an eye on the future. 
and, and prepare for that and build for that. I want to encourage you to keep looking to the future, to build for the future, to get on with life as it is. I think we've, we've come to a place uh, with all that's going on that we're going to have to seek to just live with the conditions that we find ourselves in, at least for the foreseeable future. But the great thing about Jeremiah's words here is that he's not saying it's going to be like this forever. It is going to change, and I want you to be ready for that. So take care of yourselves. Do the basics. Build houses. Plant gardens. Eat the produce. Build up your families. Have sons and daughters. Get on with your life even though it's not all that you want it to be, even though you're stuck in a place that you don't want to be, do those basic things. Could I encourage you today to do those basic things, whatever that means for you, to get on with the basics of life, to not allow your circumstances to hold you back from living, to not put your life on hold until things change until the pandemic's over, until we have a vaccine, until whatever. I know it's not perfect, and I know we might be stuck in a place where we don't want to be, but we can still build with an eye on the future. Second thing that Jeremiah says is, he says, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you, verse 7, which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. I think the second thing that Jeremiah is saying, or at least the way we could sum it up, is that they're to build outward, to look at what's going on around them, even though they don't want to be in Babylon, and even though Babylon is just about the worst place that any of these people could think of being, uh, even though it's the worst place they could think of as a, a place to live, Jeremiah says, Seek the peace of this city. Seek God's shalom for this city, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. I think there's a challenge to us in these days when it, it feels like we just need to, to keep ourselves right and to, to look after ourselves and to look after our churches. There's a challenge to us to look beyond the walls of the church, to look at what's going on around us in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our towns, in our cities, in our villages, wherever we are and begin to think of how we can be a blessing. Begin to think of how we can actually make a positive contribution to what's happening, and how we can play our part in this time of difficulty. Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city. You know, sometimes we get very spiritual or even super spiritual uh, about what God's doing in the world or what we think God's doing in the world. And, and sometimes we can look around us and think, well, maybe God's, maybe God's moving in judgment. Maybe God's doing this or doing that or doing the other thing. Jeremiah here is saying, look, you know, just, just get on with blessing the city. It's almost as though he's saying, don't, don't try to work it all out. Don't try to work out uh, what place Babylon has in God's purposes. Be a blessing to the people that are around you. And he's also saying, don't allow yourself to be distracted from that by prophetic voices or by strongly influential voices. In chapter 28, uh, the prophet Hananiah predicted that within two years, the yoke that the king of Babylon had put on the people of Judah that yoke would be broken. That must have been a very attractive word for people to hear. I think if I'd been around at that time, that's the prophecy that I would have wanted to listen to rather than Jeremiah's prophecy about 70 years. But you know, that wasn't what God was saying at all. There are many, many voices out there purporting to bring insight and counsel and, and prophetic words from God. And no doubt some of those voices are well-intentioned, but I think we have to be careful in that it's so easy to become preoccupied with trying to work out what God's doing that we forget to reach out and to bless the people that are around us. So 
build outward, look outward while you're stuck in that place that you don't want to be. And finally, I believe that what we have here is a call to build upward as well. It certainly is a time for us to to build ourselves up, to build our families up, to build our churches up, to encourage each other. It's a time to look outward and to, to bless the people around us. But there's also a call to deepen our relationship with God. Once again, listen to what Jeremiah says, those famous words of verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Verse 12, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I want to encourage you at this time to seek God with all your heart. This can be a new era in your walk with God. This can be a, a new season in your walk with God. This can be a new era, a new season for the church. Use whatever sort of terminology you want to use. But this, I believe that we can come out of this time, this time of pandemic, stronger as churches than when we went into it, if we will seek God with all our hearts. We mightn't see the impact of that immediately, or straight away, but in the long run, we will come out of it more resilient, we'll come out of it stronger, our faith will be strengthened, we'll be people of hope, and we mightn't see it in ourselves, but the people around us certainly will see it. I think, I think there's also the possibility too, and the potential for, for finding God in places that we never expected to find him. One of the things about the exile was that some of the people certainly found God in places that they never expected to find him. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 1, the prophet Ezekiel, he's at the river Kibar, and the glory of God appears to him. I don't think he would ever have expected to meet with God or for God to make himself present by a foreign river in Babylon, a, a foreign river in a foreign place, whatever way you want to put it. Kibar was a river in Babylon. It wasn't, this wasn't the Jordan River. This wasn't the sort of place that you would normally associate with God's presence. And yet, that is where Ezekiel meets with God. Or there's Daniel. If you look at uh, Daniel 4 and Daniel 6, Daniel oversees what are effectively two revivals in uh, the Babylonian Empire uh, and then in the Persian Empire because he, uh, he, he, because of his witness to King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges that God, the God of Israel, is the true God. The same is true of Darius after Daniel emerges from uh, the lion's den, Darius acknowledges that Daniel's God, the God of Israel, is the true God. Now, perhaps I'm using too much preacher's license to say that Daniel uh, oversaw two national revivals, but I think it's fair to say that the hearts of the two most important people in their respective eras were touched significantly by God through the prophet Daniel's witness and example. And I'm sure most people from Jerusalem and Judah would never have expected that to happen. They would never have expected a Babylonian king to acknowledge that their God, the God of Israel, is the true God. They would have never expected a Persian emperor to acknowledge that their God, the God of Israel, is the true God. I believe that this is a time when we can find God in places that we would never usually expect to find him and perhaps even in ways in which we wouldn't expect to find him. So if you feel that you're stuck in a place that you don't want to be, let me encourage you to keep encouraging others, to keep building up 
the people around you, to keep building up your family, to keep building up the family of God, to look for opportunities to bless your neighbors and to develop within your heart the expectation and the, the conviction that you are going to meet with God in new and fresh ways. God bless you. I hope this word has been an encouragement to you. And uh, I look forward to seeing more of you in the days to come. And I pray that as Beryl and I begin our ministry within the Scottish and Northwest regions, that we will be an encouragement and a blessing to all of you.
a great word in season for us as a church just now and hopefully a good introduction to James. Uh, we're hoping to have him come uh, in person after all this pandemic nonsense is over and that'll be really good. Um, can I just remind you that our Alpha course online starts this Wednesday night. If you want to be part of that then you can sign up at ecfpaisley.org forward slash alpha and one of our alpha team will get in touch with you. We'll see you same time next week and we'll see you then.